uh, we'll we'll follow it down with a, with a red pen. So it starts here, and as I draw these lines, it can come down, down, and then it comes down here. It just freezes it at the minimum. So this line becomes part of the function. And so if you're going above, it would go up on this one. It would just stop. And um, you you uh, you can have as many on limits uh, at any one time, and the, the the procedure actually speeds up because because if they're if they're frozen on limit, then it, it goes quicker. So that's that's the idea of how to do uh, economic dispatch and to solve these problems. Now, what we're going to do, uh, you 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 watched um, the optimization uh, problems, and uh, I we did we did two we did two. Uh, class problems there and let's see we're supposed to start this next video on economic dispatch of thermal units um, what I want to do now is um, I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a different problem for this afternoon's uh, part of the course. This is also taken from chapter three of the textbook. Um, and I need to get some more paper. Hmm. Okay. Um, you you in this in this instance we have two units, and they're they're actually the two units that we 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 described this morning. These two units, so we know the. The, the functions, and we know that they go from 20 to 100 megawatts. But we have we have a load, and I'm going to draw the load, and and uh, I'm going to look at it on um, I'm going to look at it on on the paper over here. So now. We're going to do a problem where the load comes like this, and then goes like this, and then goes like this. And this is 24 hours. So midnight to midnight. And the, the numbers uh, are from, from zero or from midnight, from zero to six uh, in the morning the load is 50 megawatts. And then from six to, to six or to 1800, we'll, we'll use the military time, the load is 150 megawatts. And then from 1800 to midnight again, so here's, here's, here's 2400 here, it, it goes back to 50. So, Obviously, we have two generating units. We'll, we'll draw them here. Here's the load. And I can go 20 to 200, 20 to 200. So I could have both generators on and just leave both of them on for the 24 hour period. Or I could run unit one and not unit two during this time. Um, I can't supply 150 with one generator. So I've got to run both of them during this period. And then I could turn one off and leave the other one on over here. Now, um, if, I take, if I take a unit, and it's on and it goes off. 
and here's the 12, the 12 hours. And I, I, I take it, or I do this. So turn on, that's the most uh, typical. Turn on has a cost of $180 occurred in taking the unit off and returning it to service. Consider, um, so if I, if I turn a unit on, it's gonna cost me. If I turn a unit off uh, and then try to turn it back on, it's gonna cost me. Um, this, is a, this, is, this is given the name startup cost in the, in the business. Startup cost. Now, why would a generator have a startup cost? Well, a large generator, you don't just turn it on, you don't turn the ignition key and it comes on like an automobile. A large generator, it has to be brought up to the right temperatures and get the steam pressures up and things before you can even start turning the, the turbine. And then once you start turning the turbine, you bring that up slowly. You don't want to just bring the temperature up very fast inside the turbine because you'll, you'll affect the metallurgy of the blades. So you have to, a very controlled temperature rise and pressure rise. And you start to turn it slowly until it comes up to synchronous speed. And then you can close the breaker and start putting more steam and start delivering power into the power system. Well, that whole period might take six or eight hours to start the boiler up, that's running fuel into it. It starts to heat up, water starts to boil. Eventually you create steam and the steam is going into the turbine and it gets up to enough pressure and the turbine starts to turn and eventually comes up to synchronous speed. That is controlled over a long period of time and you're burning a lot of fuel, but you're not creating any energy, uh, any electrical energy. All you're doing is getting everything up to temperature and you're getting the turbine generator turning at <clears throat> let's say 1800 RPM synchronous speed on a 60 Hertz system. And at a, at, at a certain point, you have enough pressure, then you synchronize it, meaning you look at the phase angle from, between the, the, the generator and the electrical system that it's connected to. And when that phase angle is as close to zero as you can, you close the breakers, get the phase angle across the breakers so that the, the generator is synchronized with the power system. You close the breaker and now you push more energy through the turbine and start to deliver power into the system. But that whole process from starting the boilers until synchronization has used a lot of energy. So that's the startup cost. It costs you something to get to that point, even though you haven't delivered any power into the system. Anyway, so this is, the, this is the problem, see? And then what we say is, would it be more economical to keep both units on in service for the entire 24 hour period or to remove one of the units for the 12 hour period from essentially from, from 1800, this is, gonna, uh, this is gonna repeat again over here. So here's six o'clock on the, on the 600. On the on the next day, I should have written six hundred. So here's, so uh, I'm I'm drawing. I'm sorry. Um, I'm I'm drawing on on this thing. You're 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 going to you're going to go over here to the next day. So. Should we, should we leave both of them on or should we run, uh, run them partially? And that's what this, that's what this, uh, this homework problem, let's go, let's go back to, uh, to displaying that. Uh, I have to go back to the other camera and share this. So 
would it be more economical to keep both units on for the entire 24 hour period or remove one of them during the period that the load is low? What is the economic schedule for the, for the period of time when it's 150? What is the economic schedule for the time when it's 50? Um, at, at the period where it's 150, it's got two generators. We can solve that. That's a, that's a simple Lagrangian exercise. And we can look at the, the other one. We can say, well, what if at 50 megawatts, if we have both units on, or if we have unit one on or unit two, one of those three is going to be minimum. So that's the that's the challenge. It's a, it's a it's a fairly challenging uh, problem just to, to to reason your way through it. And we will go through uh, the answers um, after the 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 problem uh, session. So the problem session um, for well, this will start at uh, when when we're when we're done. Um, uh, with the video. So I'm going to let you do the video on economic dispatch. There's an afternoon break and then we'll start the, the problem session about 315. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I think, let me, uh, okay, let me So I'm going to I'm going to look at the slideshow. This is the slideshow for economic dispatch. Now this is this is what you get with the video. But we we talk about the dispatch of three three generating units here and we go through the mathematics. And we develop the the Lagrange equation here and um, we take the derivatives and we we uh, we set them so this is again just all equality constraints and now we can do it with inequality constraints that's the that's the ultimate statement of it now economic dispatch is a constrained optimization problem so here it is two cost functions let's see pointer options um you build a Lagrangian and then you build these inequality constraints for the upper and low, one for the upper limit and one for the lower limit. And look at the, look at the problem. So here's our objective. Here is our equality constraint. And these are all, we have an upper, a lower limit, an upper limit, a lower limit for the, um, the, the variables and they look like this and we end up with 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 four of these Lagrange variables labeled mu we have no idea if one of if they're zero or not so that's the uh, the Kuhn, 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 Kuhn. I'm sorry I, I originally learned this in my graduate school days as the Kuhn Tucker, the KT conditions. And then somebody discovered that some fellow named Karush had actually discovered it uh, near the same time, but ahead of them. So it's, it's really called the Karush Kuhn Tucker. So KKT is the name that they gave it. And we go through case by case analysis of, of, of how you solve that. And that's what this, that's what the video is going to be about. And we talk about doing doing it with slack variables. Um, here are three generators. We we showed you an example of of solving an economic dispatch, and we we uh, searching over values of lambda. And this is the the thing that I was doing before with the. Uh, the by binary search uh, 
attributed to Walter Stadlin, and you can see these 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 lambdas going up and down here, in the range. So that's the that's the video that you're going to um, that you're going to cover, and let's see. That's the, that's the homework problem that you're going to uh, that you're going to going to work on this afternoon. It's an interesting homework problem. It's not it's it's just tedious because you have to do an economic dispatch for both units at fifty, or just unit one at fifty, or just unit two. Well, if there's one unit, then you know how much it supplies. So it's just a calculation of its cost. If it's two units, you have to do an economic dispatch. Here you got you, you have no choice. You have to have both units on. So we'll do it for both units. And now then we can then you can answer these questions down here. But it shows you this this shows you in a in a very very small uh, problem the difficulties of unit commitment. When do you commit them and when don't you commit them and, and things like that. So that's going to start. I'm going to I'm going to get you. Uh, going on video session three right now and we'll have a break uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, we'll, we'll start the problem session about about I, I'm, I'm going to say about three o'clock uh, you can you can have a break in there so we'll, we'll, we'll break three to 315 or so uh, well I mean then, then we'll start about 315 so I'll, I'll put this on the uh, here so um, restart at 315 according to our schedule for the for this problem session to solve this uh, this economic dispatch problem and then uh, we'll wrap up uh, there. Okay, so let's see, we'll, we'll switch this back to Logitech. Everybody gets to see me, for whatever that's worth. And we will see you back here in a little over an hour. Uh, if you watch the movie, watch the video, pardon me, it's a video, and then start working on the uh, on that homework problem and then we'll go over the answer uh, uh, when we when we come back if there are questions um, let's see I've, I've got some questions before we go uh, we're not seeing the slide I think I think I corrected that anyway how do you manage constraints with the binary search algorithm okay the binary search algorithm inherently handles the generator min and max constraints that's the that's the verticals but be, because let's let's get to the it's got it's got these verticals built in so as I move up and down on this once once the thing starts intersecting the vertical as it moves up it, it never goes beyond the max. So there's the max. As it comes down and it hits the lower vertical, it, it stays on here and so it keeps it. So it can't go outside. The function doesn't allow it to go up, above or below the, uh, the, the, the max min limits on the thing. So it, it handles those constraints. And the constraint where it says, I've got to equal so much demand, you 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 put a value in there as it is it above or below the demand it's below okay we'll raise it halfway up again it's still below we'll raise it halfway up again and you're taking smaller and smaller steps so you're taking tiny steps if i'm above i come back but i always come back at most a, a, a half of a, the previous step so it bump 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 and the steps get smaller and smaller and that's how you get the equality constraint. Any other constraints? No. Any other constraints such as may come about like transmission line limits and things like that, you don't handle by this, this kind of a technique. 
um, they have to be done with linear programming or or something more uh, uh, appropriate okay um, what about startup cost well th this is economic dispatch um, economic dispatch uh, assumes units on okay and and any that are off are ignored ignore units that are off okay so it it is not doing an on and off it says given this set of units What's the economic dispatch? If we're doing on and off, we're into the techniques that we're going to talk about tomorrow. But that's a good question. How did it? It assumes that the units that are on, the, <laughs> that the on units are all the all that we're interested in, uh, and and uh, we 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 solve for on and off with different techniques. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, I think we're we're good. I will keep the uh, the uh, the chat line open here, and you can you can talk to me. Um, Maybe we should we should open well okay I'm I'm not going to be up here the whole time uh, I'm I probably will be in and out but I will be in and I will look at the at the uh, chat line and if I see something there I'll I'll just start to talk during the during the time but I'm going to give you the first the first half hour or or so to uh, to watch the video and listen to the to the lecture where. You've seen the slides, but on that video, I do a lot of annotation of the slides and things like that. Um, I'm I'm five years younger on those videos than I am now. That's that's um, maybe maybe not too apparent, but we did them uh, about five years ago, I guess, 2014. We did all those all those videos. Okay, I will. Uh, I will return, let's see, I'm going to turn that thing back to this, and you will see me get up and come back, get and leave, and I'll be back in a while with probably uh, some nice cool beverage. Okay.
Okay, let me um, let me come back to uh, some of the questions that were on the text. Um, there's this question that says, um, will binary search algorithm eliminate the need for Lagrange or LP? Uh, the answer is no. Um, let's get the The binary search you you have to find lambda, which um, provides that the sum of PI is equal to the demand. Um, and, and so I, I wanna, let, let's, let's illustrate this. We, we've got these, these curves out here Let's draw another one that goes way up like this, and then it goes like that, and then up. Um, so let's let's say that that this this lambda up here is fifty, and the the minimum down here is going to be this is the max, and the minimum down here is ten. So we would start out. This is a spread of forty. So then we could go twenty. So we would start out at thirty but that's just the sum divided by 230. So this would, this would be attempt number one, we'll circle them. And if that is too low, then we go up halfway. Well, the, the, the halfway up here is, is 40. So there's number two. And let's say, this, so this is, this is low, meaning that the sum of PI is less than the demand. And up here at a lambda, so this is this is lambda. Lambda equals uh, 40, the sum is too high. So we're gonna say high. So then the next attempt is halfway, which is at 35. So that's number three. And let's say this is low again. So now we gotta go, uh, two and a half, so now we're gonna to go to 37.5, there's four. So we've gone, we've gone up to the mid, and then we've gone up halfway again, down halfway. So each time that the amount of, uh, that, that you adjust is half of what it was before. And you just keep doing that. So it, that, that's the adjustment of lambda. Now, what, the, the, the genius of it is simply that if you encounter this vertical over here, then that, that returns the answer that this unit is on P max. P max. Um, there's other units, I'm assuming, over here. This is just the first two. Um, and, and so you, you, you can have some units, for instance, if lambda were here, this unit would be at this value between min and max, whereas this one would be at p min, and, and so forth. So it's, it's the, the, the ingenious part is, is these curves that they, they automatically build in the, the, uh, the min and max. And therefore, you don't have to have explicit constraints. You don't have to have these mu well, Lagrange multipliers that we use mu, and you don't have to decide whether they're active or not. Now, here's an active on its minimum. This isn't active anymore. Neither neither constraint is active. So that's the secret of it. But you it, you you have to find the lambda. Whereas if you if you write out all the mathematics. 
um, if you knew the if you know the the mu values, then you could just solve for lambda. You'd know which ones were on their min and max, and you'd you'd have the solution. But you can't find that which units are on min and which units are on max are actually very very tricky to find, and so that's why the the binary search is is used. Um, I know that for some of the companies I worked for, that was the way you did economic dispatch. And you do it every two minutes, you adjust the, you, you recalculate the set points for economics um, and you just keep doing it over and over and over again. And you use this because it's, it's, it's fast and um, it's accurate, it, it keeps track of the unit, of the unit limits. Now, it doesn't get rid of all the theory um, and if you add other kinds of constraints, then you can't use this. So the, the other kinds of constraints would be, let's say you have a Lagrangian and you have the sum of the costs and you have plus lambda, we'll do a PD minus sum of the PI. And then I'm going to add another, this is, we'll say that's lambda one, lambda two times um, flow i j max um, is, is I'm, I'm looking at the, at a, at a function that gives us the flow, flow i j as a function of p1, p2, and so forth. Now, if I, if I want to add a constraint like this, which is an inequality constraint, I have the same trouble there that I do with these mu constraints where x plus minus x and so on, or I should say p plus p. I have the, the upper and lower bound constraints on the, on the generators. Um, these are simple looking but you don't know whether this is zero or has a number. If you knew that it wasn't zero, you can solve for the number, it's not hard. But you don't know whether it's at zero or whether it's got a positive value. That's the trouble with, the, with that one. Whereas LP, um, everything is straightforward. Um, the, the PI, um, min less than or equal to pi less than or equal to pi max and uh, flow ij max is uh, less than or equal to flow ij as a function of uh, p1 p2 up to pn uh, these are easy especially because this function tends to be, use a linear function in here, what's, what's, what's difficult then is that the C of P has to be linearized in some way. And the one that I told you about was where you, you tend to just do it with a series of, of um, small line segments. Uh, sometimes, in, in we'll, we'll talk about this when we come to optimal power flow. If I know I'm here and I want to, I, I, I'm, I just simply build, I say, okay, here's the, here's the slope of it, which comes from other theory. And, and, and then I say, okay, and that's as far as it's going to go. So I put upper and lower limits like that. That's the whole curve. And then if I end up at this point, the next iteration, uh, I'll, I'll put it here and I'll, I'll do a different slope and I'll do this little, I call this the window and you keep moving the window back and forth and, and um, you restrict it if you need to. And these are both techniques to, to accommodate the fact that the C of P function is nonlinear. And so you can, you can do very nicely with the LP, but the LP takes care of these inequalities so nicely. That's the secret of it. Um, so um, that's uh, 
just a little bit more on that. Uh, as I say, the, the, the binary search is just, is just a way of solving the Lagrange equation um, without doing it with, uh, with all the equations. Because if you do it with the equations, you don't know what to do with those mu values. Okay. Well, let's let's look at this at this uh, this problem here. Um, so. If if we look at if we look at the fifty megawatt period, fifty megawatt load. So I could have P one alone, or P two alone. Or I could have P one plus P two. I could have both of them on. Well, if P one is on alone, then it's equal to fifty. So you just plug that into the function and you get that the total operating cost is 800 and, whoop, let me write it out, F equals $810 per hour. If P1, a P2 equals 50, if it's the only one operating, then F2 is equal to $780 per hour. If they're both operating, then, then you have to do a Lagrangian. You have to say um, uh, C1 of P1 plus C2 of P2 plus lambda times 50 is the load minus P1 minus P2. And um, you, you have these limits. So effectively, you have to worry about the limit. Let's suppose you solve this with the binary search. Um, and you can you can go ahead and and um, can can work this, and you will you will find that then P one is equal to seventy, and P two equals thirty, and then F of the combination is eight hundred and seventy eight dollars per hour. Okay, now, what does that tell you? Well, that, that tells you that you're, you're better off to just run uh, number, number two. It's cheaper than operating with either number one or with both. And notice, notice interestingly, that with both, it's, it's the most expensive way to operate. So you don't want to just put them both on and leave them even though there's a startup cost that you can avoid and so forth. So, and this is, this is a lot of money dollars per hour. And it's, remember the total cost is this times six, no, I'm sorry, times 12 hours. So it's, it's quite a large number. All right, at 150, we we have to we need both generators, and again Lagrangian is C one of P one plus C two P two plus lambda times one fifty minus P one minus P two. Now we still have we can still use binary search uh, to find this answer. And the answer is that P1 equals 78.125 and P2 equals 71.875. And F uh, total for, for oh, summing over both of them is 2414.05 dollars per hour. So, um, write that better, dollars per hour. So, there's no, you, you need both of them on there.
So we could say, okay, um, here's, our, here's our options. Uh, one, both units, 24 hours. Two, um, unit one uh, for 24 hours run unit two uh, 600 to 1800, the 150 megawatt period. Or three unit two for 24 hours and then run unit one. 600 to 1800 okay those are the those are the options those are the only ways to supply that with those two generators so if you did option one um it's It's this, it's this dispatch here. This is for both, both units, okay? So that's both units. Let me push this up a ways here. There's both units. So then option one is 878 uh, dollars per hour times 12. And then I have this dispatch cost 24 14 times 12 okay and this total comes out to be 39509 uh, if you if you run through all the all the numbers there's no startup so that that didn't that didn't come into it now If I if I went to option option two, which was unit one for twenty four hours, okay. Well, then it's it's um, eight hundred and ten dollars per hour times twelve plus. Um, 2414 um, times 12 plus 180. That's that startup cost. And I get 38508.6. And option three is very similar. That's unit two for 24, uh, and then the other one comes on at the, the high load. So that's 780 times 12 plus 24, 14 times 12, plus the startup cost, 180, and that is equal to 38,508. So, um, I'm sorry, I read I read the wrong number off my answer sheet here. This one is 38868.6. This is 38508. And this is 38868, whereas the the where you run all the units all the time, it's way up. It's 39. So this is this is the most expensive. And this is the least, least cost right, right that way. So there's the, the highest cost is when you run both units. So you might as well turn it off and, and take, the, take the, the, the startup cost. Uh, as long as you run the cheaper unit for the 24 hours and just commit the next most expensive. Now, this is, this is an interesting example. Um, one of the 
simplest ways of doing unit commitment. We'll get into some of the videos of this tomorrow. One of the simplest ways of doing it is what is called um, you just have a, a, a priority list scheme. And so we have the least expensive unit, and then we have the next most expensive unit, and then the next. So what you do is you say, well, you go to each hour of the day. So, so let's say I have, a, I have load that goes up and goes up and goes up and hits a peak and then it comes back and so forth. So this is, this is a, a peak load. And it's often, oftentimes done this way in chunks. Now, 12 hour chunks is, is, is common for very broad brush planning type studies, but this, that's a little more accurate. So I go to this load and I say, can the, can the least expensive unit supply it here? And if the answer is yes, uh, let's, let's call this uh, unit, we'll, we'll number them, unit one, unit two, and unit three. They're going up in operating cost. So this one will just have unit one. Now the next one requires more, and I'm gonna start with one and then add two. And so let's say that that's, that's enough. So then, so then this period of time, I'll have unit one plus unit two. I'll just run both of them. Here, I might need units one plus two plus three. So every time I'm adding, um, a more, a more expensive unit, now it drops off. And let's say when I, when I drop this off, I can get away with just unit one and then unit one. Now, obviously it's gonna try to commit and run unit one all the time. But you simply add the next most expensive unit that's in priority. So that, that's a priority list uh, type of thing. It ignores startup costs. It ignores lots of other uh, difficulties that may that may come up, but this is this is the way they did it for a long time, uh, in in a, a priority list uh, scheme. Uh, and and this, the if 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 we were to to do it over here, un unfortunately, let me let me go back here. Yeah, for us, uh, P two was was the top priority. That's the cheapest. So we, we would have run in, in, in our example that looked like this, we would have run uh, unit two, then unit two plus unit one, and then unit two. We, we would just do, do it that way. Uh, so there's an example of a, a priority list scheme. Um, if you want, it, it, sometimes you're 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 doing um, a unit commitment or an economic dispatch for a a study. Uh, you're going to do a study of new transmission, for example, and you you need to know. Well, okay, I, I I'm I'm mainly concerned about the peak load during the summer and you have a forecast of the peak load. And then I need to know what, what that will look like as it goes through a daily cycle during the summer. So you have some daily loads like this, this one down here, uh, going up and coming down. Um, but you don't wanna get out a really elaborate unit commitment procedure. Um, a priority list is probably quite good. It, it, it's, uh, let me say it, uh, let me rephrase it. It's good enough. <laughs> it gives you a, uh, it gives you generation. And so you schedule those generators and then you 
build your model for each hour and calculate what the generators are going to put out by economic dispatch and then run um, the power flow to determine what the transmission loadings are like. But you use something really crude for the unit commitment. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be that accurate. Uh, it doesn't have to be the ultra, ultimate minimum. So th there, are, there are good techniques that are, um, that are fast and reasonably accurate that you use all the time uh, for, for studies. If you're running online and you want to get the minimum, you want to squeeze as much economics uh, out of the generators as you can, okay, then every, in daily use, you're going to use uh, a really good unit commitment program and let it run for, it'll take time and, and uh, be uh, expensive to, uh, to get all the data ready every time for it. But the priority list is easy. It's just dirt simple. Uh, you keep adding units until you got enough generation and you do that every hour. That's it. That's priority list. It's, it's uh, very simple. Okay. Um, I think, let's see here. We've, we've talked about, oh, Uh, that's the that's the special uh, special problem that I that I added in there uh, for for today for the uh, the economic dispatch. Um, there's there's a so let's um, let's kind of scope out. Uh, Economic dispatch calculation, or EDC, or just ED, um, normally you run, let's say, every, every five minutes, or maybe even every one minute. This is in real time. So we're not we're not having to worry about what units are going to be on. We know what units are on. We know what's running. Somebody else is going to turn a unit on or turn a unit off. We know what units are there, and what we need to do is is to follow it. Now, in, in this case, uh, the load isn't going like this. In this case, in real time, the load is is dancing around and wiggling up and down because there's millions of people putting uh, appliances on, turning them off, lights on and lights off, businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, uh, the system is going up and down as far as the, uh, the load. Uh, generally, it tends, to, it tends to, to follow trends up and trends down. Um, and we, we simply want to recalculate the economic set points or the economic output of each generator every few minutes. And then we want to guide it. So um, the, the, um, the economic dispatch for every generator, it calculates a piece of my um, set point. And then it, it, it sends that, uh, let's just say P1, P2, set point, down to PN, set point. And this goes into our automatic generation control. Uh, which is another whole system that whose job it is, is, is the following. Keep all generators at PI set point. 
get them near the set point. That's one. Keep frequency near 60 hertz. Now, um, if, if you have a power system, AC power system, in the world, there are 60 hertz systems in the U.S. and many countries of the world, or 50. I always tell everybody that generally 50 hertz, you'll, you'll find it in, in Europe and in Great Britain and most of the Great Britain, the British Commonwealth countries uh, use, use 50 hertz probably because they got their engineering uh, uh, advice from British uh, people and they got they got their products from British companies so they use 50 uh, that may there may be a variety of reasons and, and some countries ended up with two different frequencies Japan um, I believe still today has part of the country 50 and part of it 60 and they have to connect it with DC transmission so that they can go from 50 to DC and then to 60 and, and vice versa, so that they can transfer power back and forth. Mexico used to have 50 and 60 hertz, and they, they forced the conversion to 60 hertz um, at one time, I would say in the 80s um, or 70s. I, I don't know the years precisely. And they they had to, had to change out motors in, refrigerators and compressors and air conditioning and things uh, to accommodate the frequency change. And um, much of the equipment operates fine, no matter what the frequency is, circuit breakers and, and a lot of the equipment don't, don't care what the frequency is, but motors do. Um, there, there are other other examples um, like that around the world, um, and you you um, you need to control the frequency. The nice thing about having an AC system is that if the frequency is going down, it it tells you frequency down. It means you have you you need more generation output. Similarly, if it's going up, you need less generation output. Um, and it's a it's a virtually instantaneous signal. Um, when you do see it happen in in real dynamics, is when a generator goes offline, quits. Something happens inside the generating plant. Um, the most dangerous for pe personnel in the plant is probably when you when you sh when you have a blade from the turbine that decides to leave the shaft of the turbine and just become a missile, and and you you'll get an explosion and you get this stuff flying around the plant and the generator is shut down and the breakers open. So suddenly, almost instantly, the plant disappears. So suddenly you go from having adequate generation to having not enough. And then all the other generators have to make up for that. Well, what they do is they have each, each generator, let's say here's a, here's a turbine uh, with steam. And it's going into a turbine where we have where we have uh, blades inside here that the, 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 the steam is, is causing this to rotate. And then that goes into a generator. And out here we're measuring frequency. And we measure, we can measure it off the speed of the shaft, for example. And we just have a we have a feedback system that comes back here. And it's, and it's comparing the frequency to, let's say, 60 hertz. And there's, a, there's an adjustment of a valve. And it adjusts the, frequent, the, the steam up and down 
to try to keep that frequency. Now that's called a governor. Let me see that, yeah. That's called a governor. And that's the first thing that happens when you have a large generator loss. All the governors on the system see this frequency change immediately and open up to try to bring power up. And so all the governors affect the uh, frequency and start bringing it back up. Um, then we have AGC that looks at frequency and can also do some controlling of it, but it's, it's also worrying about keeping these generators at their set point because we've recalculated. So as we go, we go through the day, every couple minutes, we're recalculating. So these are, these are all executions of ED, of, of the economic dispatch. And those those set points are 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 adjusted every five minutes, let's say, and uh, then the the automatic generation control tries to move the the generators over to the to the next uh, the next value. Okay, so that's uh, that's how that's how we do uh, we do that uh, that part of it. Um, Ed now. If I am doing a unit commitment, and we'll, we'll get into this tomorrow. Um, for, for example, let's, let's just use that priority list. And, and I, I, I have blocked off the, the, so here we have unit one, let's say plus unit two. And here we have units one, two, three, and four. Here we have units one, two, three, four, and five, and so forth. Uh, the priority list. Well, what I, when I, what I need to know for each of these values here is I need to run an, an economic dispatch with, um, C1 of P1, C2 of P2, just the one and two. Here I have to do an economic dispatch with C1, and then I'm just gonna say C2, C3, C4. So I have all of, I have four, four generators because I've, I've committed four of them in here. And similarly here I would have uh, an ED with C1, to C5, and and each each one of them in the unit commitment program, I have to get an economic dispatch for the hour, uh, so that I can tell what uh, what is the the best, uh, uh, what what is the total cost, and with a priority list scheme, that's it. You just add a unit, and if it's if it's now enough to cover the, gener the generation you want, you're done. Very very simple scheme, but it needs it needs to run economic dispatch each each time it's it's at each step of the way during the time. Um, let's see. These are we 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 take a great deal of time to talk about transmission losses in the main course, and that is the topic of. You'll notice that um, the. Um, that the, that the the schedule talked about economic dispatch of thermal units part one. Well, part two, the video part two talks about transmission losses. Um, in a in a in a power system, um, roughly um, four to five percent transmission. Transmission losses. Uh, yes, that's a lot. I mean, if 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 Minnesota, let's say, is is supplying ten thousand megawatts, and for, forget interchange with the Dakotas or Wisconsin or Canada or anything, it's just ten thousand. We're generating it. Uh, that's that's the that's the load. Well, let's then then how much. You know how much is uh, so uh, one uh, 
one percent is a is a is a hundred megawatts, right? So so four hundred megawatts, let's say, is losses. So then I have to generate ten thousand four hundred megawatts. Well, that's that's a lot. That's a that's a generator. That's a large generating plant or two, depending on the, what what you're looking at. But uh, that could be a large generating plant just to supply the losses. So you want to minimize, or you want to take account of the losses in the in the system at all times. And that's that certainly is is one of the things that uh, that we have to do. Uh, but it's not uh, we're, we we decided when we set this course up three days is is too is too brief to get into too much uh, with with transmission losses but i want you to be aware that uh, transmission losses are are important um you reduce transmission losses by raising voltages that's why we go to 345 and 500 kv uh, Minnesota has, if you guys are working in Minnesota, you go up I-35 to Duluth, and when you get to Hinkley, keep your eyes open just as you come into the city of Hinkley, you will see a 500 kV transmission line going right over I-35. Um, and that's a 500 kV line that, that connects a substation north of right, right outside the uh, Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and it connects up to one in D near Duluth. And then from there it goes up into Canada. So it's a main backbone system of the, of the state, 500 kV. The higher the voltage, the lower the current for the same amount of power, the lower the current, uh, then even lower are the losses. So we keep them down to, to this. now. Um, you could reduce it more, but probably the cost savings are not going to justify the the new equipment uh, costs and things like that. So, um, in the um, in the course tomorrow, uh, we're going to cover uh, unit commitment. That'll be the first thing in the morning. And I will give you some problems to do with unit commitment. And then we're going to give you some transmission effects. Now, this is not losses so much as uh, how, do you, how do you calculate transmission uh, flows? Uh, <clears throat> and and <clears throat> if you want it really accurately, how do you calculate the um, the the voltage, the the AC flows and the voltage and the reactive flows and things like that? You need a full AC power flow. Um, and then the 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 this this topic here is the security. Uh, that's that's the issue of of how do I test the system to see if to see if we're going to get um, a cascading outage if we lose one line. If we lose a line and we're going to suffer cascading outages where it just gets one generator fails, then, the, then one line fails, then we get an overload on another line, so it fails, and then two more go, and that happens very rapidly in, uh, in less than a minute or so, you can have a large part of your system is out and it doesn't take long before the whole thing is, uh, the lights are out everywhere. And people are screaming and complaining. And um, <laughs> I, have, I have had the experience of living through a blackout in New York State, a blackout in California, um, I've been through blackouts, but they weren't major. They were sort of just regional within Minnesota as well, but not, never a very large, there's not been a real large one out here where we lost multiple states. But I did, I did experience that. And 
very interesting. I remember the one, the first one in New York State. Uh, politicians always want to draw attention to themselves, so they jumped up and yelled, it's time that we nationalized the electric grid. Uh, let the government do it so that it can do it right. And of course, that's that's not that's not going to work. Government utilities are not, uh, in my opinion, that much more reliable than privately operated, privately owned and operated uh, utilities. And um, but but. There's always political repercussions of blackouts, huge political repercussions. <laughs> the last one, the 2003 blackout, the, I talked to the chief operator from First Energy, which is a company in uh, Akron, Ohio. He said when he, he was out of the building that afternoon and, and he, came, he came back, as soon as he knew that there was a blackout happening, and as he approached, he said, up on the roof was a was a, a guy with a machine gun, an automatic weapon. And um, he was from Homeland Security or something like that. They thought maybe that the, the power system had been attacked. Uh, that's how sensitive they were to maybe terrorists or maybe some, some sort of act of war. And a friend of mine got a call from somebody in Washington that wanted to know if this was a computer attack, a cyber attack. Uh, the, the number of books and articles about cyber attacks causing blackouts just is never ending. There's always a new book out. Um, and it seems to me that they're not always well written and they're not written by knowledgeable people, but cyber attacks have been used to, to uh, bring down the power system. So it's a big concern for people. So we're going to talk about that power system security uh, issue, as well as unit commitment. Uh, that'll be our, our topics for, uh, for tomorrow. Uh, <clears throat> my voice is running out. I've got one more question here. Uh, in running one or two machines, in reality, there are other costs uh, in addition to, to, to startup costs. Uh, aging, absolutely right, um, which translate to more frequent maintenance and many start and stop. This is an issue that system operators are reluctant to accept, and, but it is true. Um, and it's, it's one of the big problems today when, when, you're, when you're using a, a sort of conventional generator and, and it's there, to fill in when wind or solar is not generating, which tends to go up and down, up and down can go. And, and so you need some sort of conventional, you might have gas turbines that come on. Um, when they come on and start up and run up and then they run down and turn off and so forth, uh, those kind of rapid start uh, generators yeah, they have a they have a, a wear and tear on them. Uh, I used to see that sometimes in economic dispatch, there was a, a wear and tear feature of uh, of it, but they don't they don't uh, build that into the algorithms too much, um, other than just startup costs. And maybe they build that into the startup cost uh, and uh, just let it let it accumulate. But that's that is true that that plants starting up and shutting down. An, another one is is frequency. If if you're trying to control frequency and you're you're chasing every little deviation, there are there are gears and valves inside the big steam plant, and as you 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 change the change the gears the gears run up and down to open and close the valves. And they're doing that all day long, opening and closing, closing, open, open, and so on. Uh, that tends to be wear and tear. So that a, a well-designed automatic generation control system will try to minimize the amount of of chasing that the chasing the frequency changes that that the generators have to do, simply because it it tends to to be wear and tear on them, uh, a lot of wear and tear. Um, 
So I think um, I think I'm going to call it a, a day. If there's any other questions here, uh, let's see. Um, you talk about AGC. What about voltage regulate? Who controls it? Voltage is related to VA reactive. It's volt regulated from the system operator or locally at the generation, small voltage support economic. Okay, vol that's a good, let's, let's talk about voltage regulation. Uh, I guess we're, we're still on the camera up here, voltage regulation. Um, the way you, the, 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 the first way, here's a generator. And you you know the, the the simple model of a generator is that you have a you have a a um, you have a coil, and you have a, you have three coils spaced by 120 degrees, and then you have um, you have the the field winding. So this is this is the field winding, and this is the field, and the field is is DC current, and the more current, the stronger this this magnetic field that surrounds the rotor, and um, the more voltage that you get out of the the coils that that effectively are the uh, the three you know, your A, B, C, three phase conductors. And so you measure, you measure the voltage here. I just, I like to use a diamond as a, as a measure. So here we get voltage magnitude out and we have a control system that, that basically comes back and adjusts um, the current. So that let's say this is the, uh, this is a power supply here. It used to actually be a small mechanical generator, and they would they would control that generator. But here it's now a power electronics, and they can they can change this. Now there's got to be a, a system, let's say, of slip rings uh, inside the the generator to to bring it into the rotating uh, field. And so you measure it, and you control the voltage out there. But but there's got to be a set point. And generally you can change you can set the you can you can change the set point. And that's one of the features of an of an optimal power flow. Um, you dispatch the system and it will it will calculate the best voltages uh, to put on the on the system. Um, and so the system operator to my knowledge rarely makes uh, direct adjustments on system voltage unless there's some some problem but they could uh, but the the optimal power flow may adjust that set point or change it or they may just fix it from planning studies and then and then just let the the generator try to uh, to meet it now what what happens where where you get into uh, voltage problems is like this. You you have a you have a generator here, and let let's say we have two parallel lines, and they're really long. Okay, and it's mostly inductive, resistive, and so as you're shooting a lot of current through here, you have I squared X, which is Q, and you're losing it, and that's a loss. So you have I squared X loss, or reactive losses in the lines. Well, they're designed so that uh, the, the Q that's needed for that can be made up from the generator. Okay, now, all of a sudden, we lose this line. Uh, again, insulator fails, um, mechanical failure, whatever. The line goes out. Well now, if you're, th this, this line, this current becomes 2i, uh, uh, roughly, and now the i squared x 
goes to 2i squared uh, x. Uh, I did not why did I, yeah, 2i and that's squared. So that becomes 4 times i squared x. So suddenly I need four times the amount of, of uh, before, let's say before I was supplying q and q, and now I, that's 2q, and now with the line out like this, and this one is open breakers, so we'll just draw some breakers that are, that are open here. Open and open. Um, now I have to shoot not two, but I gotta I gotta shoot four Q. So I gotta double the output of the of the reactive of the generator. And generally what what happens when you're when when you're pushing more reactive power out, the voltage um, the voltage in here, the voltage magnitude drops. Drop in voltage output. And this thing has a limit. And that's because the current that goes through the, the rotating element hits a maximum. And it, it just can't push any more current or it'll burn it out. So they, 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 they don't let it go beyond the max. And then you're still drawing more reactive power. The voltage will go down. And that's, that means you don't get 4Q. You only get 3. So you get insufficient amount of Q into the system like this, and then the whole system begins to go down. And typically, you, you can get into a voltage collapse situation when you don't have enough reactive source. The chief source of reactive power are generators. You can then use capacitors or you can use um, uh, static var compensators, which is a is a is a is a fancy way to say uh, power electronic units that can supply reactive power um, and uh, supply supply it uh, uh, without cost. Uh, it do doesn't cost anything to to, uh, to operate it. Well, it costs a tiny bit, but but it's 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 not like having to have a generator online. Um, and so reactive reactive loading is a, has become a very very important uh, and there were there have been various outages in the in the world there was one in 1978 in France where they attributed the collapse itself to voltage collapse the new new terminology <clears throat> and then that's that off of, uh, you know spawned a lot of studies on voltage collapse uh, kind of phenomenon. But again, the operator doesn't, doesn't I, I, I don't think operators get into the voltage too much. Uh, they may have uh, optimal power flow trimming it up and down to try to minimize losses and things like that. Um, the real worry is this situation where suddenly I need more reactive and the voltage hits its, the voltage regulator hits its max and you can't put out any more Q. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we're set now. Uh, I, I think uh, unless there's another uh, question on, the, on the, the, the chat window here, we will see you at uh, 8.30 tomorrow morning uh, where we will commence uh, talking about unit commitment. Okay. And we will we will say good night. There we go. I hope my voice holds up. This has been a tough summer with all the rain. My allergies have gone nuts, and my voice uh, seems to be affected. But we'll talk uh, right here. Okay. Bye bye. And let's see. Good night. Good night.